in a very uncertain time. When things are foggy, you don't know what to do next by definition. And that's why my mantra is just follow your guts. It means following your values, following your principles. Do not look back what your predecessors have done and try and copy them. Be yourself. You will find the right answer. Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, the former chief executive and also a leadership advisor. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they've challenged the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. Also, you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. So today we're talking with the CEO of the world's second largest insurance company and someone who is genuinely at the forefront of sustainability and climate change in the role of protecting property, people, and assets. So Clark, I am really excited to hear how our guest has led change. And oh my God, has he led a lot of change. He has led what is known as one of the most radical transformations that the insurance industry has seen. So I'd love to hear how he's done that. I'd actually also love to hear his point of view on climate change. He is someone that does things, not just says things. And I'd love to hear what role he thinks corporates can play to protect our environment. Yeah, I'm excited. To me, the people we typically interview who have transformations and change are fixing things. I think he's really unusual that he went into a really strong performing company, redefined it, and has made it more successful. There weren't problems per se. He's taken success and redefined it to greater success, which I think is really unusual and really the reason we wanted him on Redefiners to ask these kind of questions. How do you make good greater? How do you make great better? So Clark, enough suspense. Tell our listeners who our guest is today. There you go. Our guest today is Thomas Buberl, the CEO of AXA Group which is, as you said, one of the largest insurers in the world, has 153,000 employees, operates in 54 countries, and over 100 million clients in three business lines, property casualty, life and savings, and asset management. A truly, truly global company. But as you mentioned, Thomas has also been incredibly vocal about the need to take action on climate change and protect global biodiversity. So I think it's going to be a pretty wide-ranging chat, and I'm looking forward to it. Thomas, thank you for joining us on Redefiners. Welcome. Thank you very much to both of you. So Thomas, let's go back, if we can, to 2016, when you became CEO of AXA and went through what is quite, at least in my point of view, a daunting vetting process. The board asked you to write three chapters of a book about yourself. Is that correct? Answering, you know, who you are, what's your vision for AXA, and how would you implement that vision? So, I mean, uh, the process started much earlier. Uh, The book was the final stage. At the time, we had uh, seven candidates, and I was probably the number seven out of seven because (laughs) uh, I was the youngest. Uh, I was not French. I had the least tenure within AXA. And so at the time, I thought, okay, if they consider me in that process, let's participate, let's learn from it, because AXA in France is an institution. I mean, uh, I have two legendary predecessors, one that has really built the company from scratch, uh, the other one has, you know, really transformed it into a uh, global institution with a very strong culture. So, um, yeah, it was for me uh, impossible to even think about uh, getting there. But as the process went on, we got closer and closer, and the book really changed this process, because at the beginning, it was not only three chapters, it was 60 pages. And it was not only one version, but it was three versions of it. So it was a great deal of work next to a operational job uh, that I had. But I realized later, it was actually my contract with the board, because A, the board got to know me. And it's interesting, I also got to know myself better. And when my wife was proofreading it, uh, she also said, oh, I didn't know that about you, (laughs) despite the fact that we were married for a long time. So yes, if I ever had to look for a successor, I would do the same to him or her. You said as you went through it, you learned about yourself 
and even your wife learned about you. Can I ask specifically, what did you learn about yourself? What I learned about myself is that, you know, life is not a straight line. Mm -hmm. And there are some moments in life that define or redefine your life. And when I was writing about my own life, I mean, obviously, uh, there is the very beginning, which brings a lot to you in terms of your values, your principles of your life. And you live with them without really explicitly thinking about them. So that was my first point, really thinking about what do I stand for? What are my values? Because this is very important as well with the culture uh, of the company. And do you fit? Because if you don't fit, then the whole thing doesn't work. The second one is my life was defined and redefined in good moments, but also in bad moments. So at some point, I was really on the track to become a professional organ player. And so I, I worked my way through the different exercises, but I unfortunately couldn't follow my dream at the time of becoming a professional organ player because one part of the exam was to be very good in singing, which I'm not and I'm still not. And so I could not continue this wonderful experience and this wonderful profession, which forced me to go somewhere else. You raise a very interesting point in that you learn as much from your successes as your failures, whether it's as a failed musician or, you know, whatever it may be, and that you need to reinvent yourself. Clark, can I turn the table on you? Because your attempt at becoming CEO of Russell Reynolds also didn't work the first time. Were there any lessons that you learned from that failure? There were, and it was a very visible failure. I was and am close to Russ Reynolds, the founder of the firm. And the subsequent CEO, Hob Brown, people, I think, thought, and I was told repeatedly, big first mistake, don't listen, well, you're a shoe in you're going to run the company next. Mm. Uh, and then I did not. And Matthew Wright, uh, my British partner and great friend, became the CEO. So the hardest part was one day I'm almost the chief executive of the firm, and the next day it was like I was, it was, like I was invisible. I wasn't there because nobody knew what to say. So they didn't say anything. So all of a sudden, you're just kind of alone, uh, and it's quiet and no one, no one knows what to do. So you got to find yourself. I had to find myself and get back into it and move ahead. And I have to tell you, the first year was a complete reshuffling of both priorities, aspirations, and what matters in life. I happened to have four young children at the time, and there was a reshaping as I kind of dug back into my career. But it was a moment. Brutal. Yeah. Thomas, just going in, I like what you just said. Axe is known for having a strong culture. And also, knowing enough about your values and your principles, can you talk a little bit about this moment of writing the chapters, but then being chosen? And did you articulate those principles and values as forming what would become your leadership of AXA? When you go through the succession process, and obviously you rise to the end of the decision, it feels great. But then when you have your first day of office, the counter goes back to zero. Mm. And you start at the bottom again. And that's why I always try to be <laughs> extremely humble and worked my way up. And so when I was uh, facing for the first time 2,000 of my colleagues where I had to give an inspirational statement of what are we going to do next, this was not easy at the beginning. When I was meeting investors, when I was meeting regulators, journalists, um, this was all new. I thought, okay, how could I organize myself? And internally, what I did, I took the two most senior people in the company and said, look, you are my life insurance, you are my deputies, and you need to help me because there was no conflict of interest. Secondly, I had a very good board and I had a very good relationship to my board members because they had all chosen me to help me to really get on the journey. And thirdly, my predecessor, you know, we had a very, very uh, good transition. Normally a transition happens where you get uh, into fights with your predecessor, where one talks badly about the other. Nothing at all of this. My predecessor is my best mentor, even to this day. I came in this role not having the track record and not knowing everything. I came in this role as an orchestrator to shape together with my guys uh, the future. And so what happened afterwards was not planned from the first day. So a great company, you become chief executive, and with all due respect, not flattery, it's become even greater, which we'll come into in a minute. But you said the capacity to reinvent, to question, and to constantly learn is the most important thing. You've said it many times in your career. So what can we learn from that? So I mean, when I came in, what did I realize? Uh, I realized, um, one, the company is fantastic and has a great culture, has a great history, so something to keep and very good talents. We have very good people. 
However, when you looked at the business profile of the company, we were 80% in life insurance. And so at a time where interest rates are low, this is not a great position to be in. And I said, look, what can we do? And so the shifts came from there. And I took my predecessor on the journey. I took my board on the journey from the very beginning. And this has helped a lot. Great that you had a supportive board, Thomas, but some of the moves that you made were not perceived so well by the market and your investors. And if I am correct, I think when you announced the acquisition of Excel, the stock price went down by 10%. Tell us how that felt and how you coped with that and whether you doubted yourself when that happened. So that felt obviously very terrible because, again, I started from 80% life insurance and I knew I need to get away from it. And so we changed the company from 80% life insurance to 10% life insurance, keeping the same revenue of 100 billion euro, which is massive. Mm -hmm. And so there were massive transactions involved. One was quoting a company and buying another company. Unfortunately, I had to buy before I quoted, which was a very big surprise to the shareholders and said, what are you doing there? Why do you rock the whole company? So we had a massive storm against this by mm. our shareholders, by analysts. And what's quite interesting is that the same people that criticize this massive transformation are now praising it. Uh, so I think number one is you need to have a conviction that yeah. what you do is right in the long term, even though it's, it's maybe perceived as being a surprise in the short term. Secondly, and I give you again a, a story about my two predecessors, yeah. both of them had done big deals. And on the day, they both phoned me and said, look, the share price has dropped by 10%. That is a pity. But when I did my big deal, it dropped by 16%. Hmm. So you are better than I am. Okay. So actually you were doing well. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a matter of perspective. Yeah, absolutely. But again, I think the learning is don't go against your convictions. Mm. If you have convictions and if they are strong and if your team is behind them, you can master also very stormy times. Great point. Don't go against your convictions. Great point. In the world of change, culture has to change. And we had a chat with Jim Snabe, who I'm sure you know well, and he said transformation is about reinventing from a position of strength and that culture change is as important in navigating an unpredictable future. I would fully agree with Jim because culture for me is the glue that keeps an organization together. And AXA, by its history, is a very decentralized company. And one of my first decisions was to make it even more decentralized and say, look, if we have strong local operators, give them the power, give them the trust because we employ them to do good. So that was one of the first decisions to empower and to simplify, but also to make sure that we are working along the same values. Because certainly in a very uncertain time, when things are foggy, you don't know what to do next by definition. And that's why my mantra is just follow your guts. It means following your values, following your principles. Do not look back what your predecessors have done and try and copy them. Be yourself. You will find the right answer. It means following your values, following your principles, and also showing a behavior that is expressed by that. Hmm. And so with the investment that we make, with the uh, underwriting that we make, we are shaping trends. So, I mean, we're insuring people on the health side. We are investing in coal, not anymore. We're investing in all sorts of things. And we said, look, we can make a change in society through our action. Yeah. And that's why we said, look, our culture needs to move on to work into a purpose in which we say all we do on the question of investment, on the question of underwriting, is doing good for society. To use it, I need to create a group, which was called at the time the Partners, which mm -hmm. is beyond my immediate team, to really, A, be connected to the markets and also use the wisdom. And so together with them, my team, the, all the country CEOs, we developed this together, we worked on it together, and we also measure all the time, how are we doing? So, for example, on the question around being close to the customers, we started at, I think, we were 40% of the customer satisfaction was at or above market. Today, it's 97. Employee satisfaction. We use employee net promoter score. When we measured the first time, we were minus one. Today, we are 38 plus. Hmm. And so, we have a constant measuring point, also in a way that is transparent to the whole organization. So when we do this pulse survey with the employees 
it goes from, I don't know, Tuesday, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till Friday at 1500. At 15.03, the results are visible for everybody in the whole AXA world. Oh, so wow. there is no filtering before wow. and, and so wow. on. And you have benchmarking. Because I was actually inspired at the time by consultants. You benchmark the German operations against the UK, against the Swiss, and they have to explain themselves in front of their own people wow. why they haven't done or have done something. And that keeps a good uh, sporty culture. Yeah, well, and it drives an awful lot of accountability. Oh, sure. Um, and ownership. I love what you said, Thomas, which is to bring change in society through action. Now, you are very passionate about climate change and sustainability. And when it comes to action, you have announced that you're going to invest 1.5 billion euros to help fight deforestation and biodiversity. Can you tell us about why you've made that investment and what are your views on the role that at least the insurance industry and potentially sort of other big corporates can play in dealing with and improving the climate crisis? So we had this realization early on, and it was one of my first decisions. Before I took the CEO job, I was also responsible for the health business. Mm -hmm. And what was bizarre to see is that on the one hand, an investment in coal at the time had a very good return. But on the other hand, we had sufferings of our patients in health, suffering from cancers and so on. We had large enterprises being hit by floods and so on on the natural catastrophe side. So we said, look, this makes no sense. We can't earn a bit more and then have massive destruction and uh, also suffering in society from it. So we decided, look, it's good for us to get out of there. And we were the first ones at the time to decide we went out of coal. Mm -hmm. We then went out of tobacco and so on. And we aligned our portfolio to the 1.5 degree scenario, which meant that the very bad industries we got out mm -hmm. and everybody else that had a chance to transition, we want to help and accompany them. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, we all said to ourselves, look, it's not enough if we do it. Mm -hmm. We need to entice our colleagues to do it. And so we've built what's called the Net Zero Insurance Alliance mm -hmm. quite recently, which is to say, look, investment and underwriting needs to be fully aligned. We need to be doing exactly the same for the service of the environment. And we need to bring all our competitors together to agree on principles to do the same. Because we can only be strong as an industry if we are together, not if we are just alone. We'll be right back with Thomas. But first, we're going to take a quick break with Lamore Zilberman, a managing director in our Chicago office. Lamore delves into what executives are looking for when considering a new role. A lot of things have changed due to the pandemic. Technology transformation has accelerated in both our business and personal lives. Many of us now work from home, either part or full time. And if leisure wear is now part of our work from home wardrobe options. Along with these changes, bringing in great talent has also seen an evolution. So what are some of the key trends to keep in mind when you're seeking new leaders? We're seeing a more established trend where work is personal and personal is work. Organizational culture is critical. Candidates are looking for alignment between their values and the organizational purpose and mission. They're considering how the organization is contributing to their community, to their industry, and to their employees' experience and engagement. Candidates are also prioritizing their mental, emotional, and physical well-being and seeing how that might be impacted as they consider new job opportunities. And finally, they're looking at how organizations are investing in talent development and career path planning for their employees. Candidates want to know that if they're going to make a move, the organization they're joining has opportunities for advancement with clear steps and milestones in their career journey. To learn more about hiring tips and trends, go to www.russellreynolds.com insights. And now back to our conversation with Thomas. Thomas, you've also launched Access Climate School, which is an interesting initiative where you're, I guess, hoping to educate business leaders and the impacts of climate change. What else are you hoping to achieve with that school? So the Climate School was actually a desire that our employees had because okay. they said, look, this climate change is such a complex and such a massive transition. We would like to understand more what it means and also how can we help to do it? And so our AXA climate team, they developed this and it was really a byproduct. It then got a lot of awareness in other companies. And so today we are selling this to other companies as a tool. But I think if you want to be active and serious about climate, 
the number one step is to educate your own people. Yeah. What does it mean? Where are the opportunities? And also that they shouldn't be frightened around it because uh, there's also many frightening elements in it. We've interviewed a number of sustainable leaders, given we at Russell Reynolds are creating a framework to assess leaders based on sustainable competencies. Many of the leaders, CEOs, have said that the naysayers on sustainability, climate change, ESNG, one can deal with, handle, and help them understand why this is good for the world. But the fence sitters, and it's come up again and again and again in countries all around the world, many languages, the same phrase, the fence sitters on sustainability are the hardest to deal with because they sit back quietly. And if you fail, they say, I told you so. And if you win, they say, oh, I was in favor all along. Do you have any advice for handling fence sitters in general or in sustainability specifically? The fence sitter model is not a very sustainable model because you can hide in the short term, but you cannot hide in the medium term. Um, at the end of the day, when we talk about sustainability, we don't talk about what is the check that you have filled in or what are the very nice slides that you have produced. It's about results. And so as an investor, as an underwriter, I will want to know from you, okay, what's your plan? How exactly do you get there? Which initiative, which measurement, which time frame? So the fence sitter has to declare him or herself very quickly and you will be pulled down from the fence. So it is not an advisable and sustainable strategy to sit on the fence. Come down and play the game. You're just wasting your time. Force the fence sitter to declare, measure them and see their results or not. At Russell Reynolds Associates, we've interviewed over the past 18 months, a number of sustainable leaders all over the world, figuring out what makes them different from other leaders. And we've built this diagnostic to help boards run succession processes now using sustainable competencies, use the framework to help assess, judge, and promote sustainable leaders to become CEOs. We feel very strongly as we meet so many sustainable leaders, this sense of the ecosystem will make more progress than clearly government policies or single companies. So, for instance, Soren Sorensen has made this obligation on Mayersk shipping to invest $7 billion in methanol-fueled ships. But they don't make the methanol. So Yara, a fertilizer company, which has a lot of methane gas, is producing clean ammonia and then methanol to fuel the ships. We have to have joint solutions. So the Net Zero Insurance Alliance is fantastic to hear about. And just going back to one thing about technology, I would think of insurance prices products based on history, historical data. And yet, if you're focused on climate change and the future in 1.5 degrees, you have to price for the future instead of history. What are you using in terms of AI or machine learning to price how does the industry focus forward instead of backward? You're absolutely right, Clark. I mean, we are using all of these tools to the pricing, so we don't only look today backwards, but uh, we also look very much forwards. We have a fundamental industry problem, which is that uh, the insurability of certain dangers will become more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. Take your health. Health costs are increasing three, four times the GDP growth every year, which means by definition that less and less people will be able to be insured every year. The only way to go against it and help is if we are helping our patients to live a better life. So our business model in the next phase needs to move from the claims payment is in the center of our relationship to the claims payment is the exception of our relationship and that's where, for example, digital services play and technology plays a massive role. So we recently launched a platform called Digital Health Platform together with Microsoft in which we provide symptom checking, in which we provide telemedicine, in which we provide digital help to follow chronic diseases. The same is being applied on all the industrial risks when you think about shipments, if we talked about ships, there's a massive issue around uh, damage to containers, damage to the good in containers. You can use technology, IoT, to follow that and really help to improve the experience of the shipment without having a claim. And so that's where technology will play a massive role and already starts playing a very important role. You were known, Thomas, about reinvention and transformation. How do you stay fresh? How do you yourself 
think of what might be reinvented? How do you stay current on what questions to ask? You need to talk to people, talk to people, talk to people. Mm. Life is a mosaic. And with every discussion, you add a piece more of the mosaic. And so in one of the preparations for the famous book at the very beginning, I also studied some interesting religious rules at the time that were not you know, meant to, for me to convert to something, but to be inspired by it. And one of the rules was, go to people you expect nothing from, you will only be surprised. Yeah. And so this is what I'm doing today. Every day, I'm meeting people that I haven't met before. And this is true internally inside the company, but also outside the company. And I come with no agenda mm. and we just talk. But by talking and talking about somebody else's challenges, you learn a lot about yourself. Mm. Fantastic. Thomas, we are unfortunately running out of time. What we like to do at the end of each podcast is to end with some rapid fire questions. This is where we ask you a series of questions and we ask you to respond as quickly as possible. Are you ready? I am ready. Go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. So let's start. Question number one, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? Talk to as many people yeah. as you can. If you could have an extra hour of free time every day, how would you use the extra hour? I would go horse riding. What is very important is to have a good balance. And for me, going horse riding, being in nature, uh, is something where you need to focus your attention completely on your horse and mm -hmm. on the environment and where you can't think about anything else. So it's complete disconnection. Yeah. See, Thomas, for me, that's the equivalent of skiing. I'm a really bad skier and I love skiing holidays precisely for that reason, because you're just concentrating on getting down the mountain. Exactly. Except that on the skis, you need to focus on yourself and your own movements. On the horse, you have the unknown in the animal. True. True. Would you rather be the funniest or the smartest person in the room? And you can't say both. Definitely the funniest, because for me, the CEO is the chief excitement officer. And uh, when you mm. don't have excitement in your life and in the company, it's very boring. I like that. What is your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure. So we have a second product line at AXA, which is vineyards. Uh, my uh -huh. predecessor bought a lot of vineyards and um, <laughs> they're extremely good and uh, I love them too much. Yeah. And the last one, what is one important skill that you think every person should have? Humility. Asking yourself every day, how can I do better? Uh, how can I reinvent myself? Fantastic. Thomas, thank you for being here. There's so much to take away. So what do we learn from this discussion? Redefining moments are good and bad. And when you failed, you've got to pivot and move elsewhere. Also, the sense of reinventing a successful company as a leader. But in creating change, bring the board or the leadership team along with you. No secrets, no behind the door. Say, let's learn and go on this journey together. You said when things get foggy, follow your gut. Never go against your conviction. Your conviction, your gut is right. Even when the stock drops 10%, stay with your conviction. A strong culture getting stronger. And at AXA, evolving this culture into a modern world, into a company of purpose that insurance can do good for society through your actions, being courageous. And governance Finding collaborative wisdom. I've never heard that before. Measuring and using the wisdom of the team several levels down to make sure that we're maximizing the governance structure to have collective wisdom. The Net Zero Insurance Alliance to bring people together around innovation and making change as an industry. I thought most powerful was go to people you expect nothing from to learn from them. For you as a redefining leader, Learn from them and put another piece into the mosaic. This is how you keep reinventing yourself and your leadership style. Finally, this huge issue on sustainability of the fence sitters. We can handle the naysayers, but the fence sitters are those who hide in the shadows. Call them off the fence and say, what are you going to do? How will you do it? Let us measure what you're doing and see results. A fantastic discussion. Have a great day, and we really, really appreciate you joining us. 
Thank you. Thanks, Nas. Thanks, Clark. And uh, have a great day and hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com. Find us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time.